Welcome to Popcorn Psychology, the podcast where we watch blockbuster movies and psychoanalyze them. My name is Brittany Brownfield, and I'm a child therapist, and I'm joined by... Ben Stover, individual therapist. Hannah Espinoza, marriage and family therapist. We are all licensed clinical professional counselors, also known as therapists, who practice out of Chicago. Even though we are licensed mental health professionals, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes and to fulfill our love of dissecting pop culture in all forms. Please remember that even though we are all licensed therapists, we aren't your therapist. If you are struggling with mental health symptoms, please find a local mental health provider. Hi, so today we are getting into Spirited Away, um, our first Studio Ghibli movie, um, and also the first one that any of us have ever actually watched, I think. Nope, I watched oh. Princess Mononoke in high school. Well, then never mind. Oh. <laughs> mm. And I've never seen this one before. Yeah. So, yeah, we are jumping into, um, we haven't done a lot of, have we done any animated movies? Beauty and the Beast? Beauty and the Beast, we did, yeah. But no, uh, no anime. This is our first foray into mm-hmm. the world of anime. Yeah, and yeah, so this is Spirited Away, 2001, beloved movie by, like I said, Studio Ghibli. It's Hayao Miyazaki, um, who's done, like you said, Princess Mon... What's it? Princess, Princess Mononoke, mm-hmm. Howl's Moving Castle, mm-hmm. oh, My I've Neighbor heard of that Totoro, mm-hmm. several others. These are beloved films, and we got a lot of requests to do an anime, mm-hmm. and uh, a few of my childhood friends had requested this, Ed and pierce both separately requested this as well as getting several requests uh throughout twitter and facebook so this mm-hmm. is definitely a fan request episode and we were excited to take this on and do something that none of us had ever seen before so i'm interested to to know if we're gonna hit the things that people want us to hit in yeah this me movie. too i guess we'll find out <laughs> So, so for those of you that are uh, listening, you know, drop, take, a, drop a line, right? And take a second. And while you're doing so, take a second, make sure to give us a like and a rating and a review on Facebook or iTunes, wherever you listen, make sure to Apple podcast, you nerd, Apple podcast, Ben, they can rate us and review us wherever <laughs> they like, wherever they're comfortable with, but please make sure to do that. That helps us grow guys. So please make sure to do that. Yeah. So yeah, so the point, uh, the plot of Spirited Away, well, there's a lot that happens in Spirited Away. So if you need a full, full plot, I recommend you do what I did, which was read the plot on Wikipedia immediately after finishing the movie, because it drops you right in. Yep. It drops is, you totally yes. in. Um, so basically what we're going to talk about today, um, which is the main character, Chihiro, which is the person we follow throughout the movie. So basically a 10-year-old girl who is moving to a new home it seems like a whole new city a whole new place yeah it's, it's a totally different yeah locale than wherever she lived so with like her moving from this the city to the country basically yeah and so she's really bummed about that and which i loved her ornery attitude and on the way to their new home her parents get sidetracked visiting what looks like a deserted theme park mm-hmm. and then they what they realize is that it's actually a spirit world they kind of go through a tunnel and enter into a kind of a theme park bathhouse attraction for spirits and so her parents right away get turned into pigs and then the rest of the movie is is chihiro trying to get through all these challenges that face her while trying to survive in this spirit world where she is where she doesn't quite belong no, she's under constant yeah. threat. They don't want humans there. They consider humans gross and smelly. Smelly. Mm-hmm. And they want. She's in under constant duress and has to survive the situation to figure out how to get her parents turned back from pigs. Mm-hmm. It reminded me right away of like Alice in Wonderland in the sense of being dropped into a whole other world with like no context and spending the whole movie just trying to f- go with kind of go with the flow <laughs> like figure out like where you are and what to do while stumbling upon like different adversaries sort of along the way mm-hmm. um so with this movie we're going to be talking about anxiety versus trusting in yourself we're also going to be talking about in the same vein empowerment and i'm going to get into a little discussion around free range parenting as that aligns with that idea sounds great <laughs> yay <laughs> So I think in the beginning of this movie, you definitely see, I, well, I, she's an anxious kid, but I think she's like, I don't know. She's 10. So I don't know if I would say she's like 
appropriately anxious for her age, but I don't think she's overly anxious for her age. She is a bit more on the anxious side. Yeah, we certainly see her in positions that would make anyone who's reasonable extremely yeah. uncomfortable. She's in a foreign environment. Her Everything from her, every one of her instincts, every one of her spider senses mm-hmm. is going off and telling her, we should not be here, and her parents are ignoring her. Dad yeah. is kind of doing his own thing and being like, no, it's fine. You know, and mm-hmm. it, you know if, if any of us have learned anything from having dads in our lives is that anytime <laughs> dad says it's fine, it's not fine. It's just, it's not. Like, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's not. Well, yeah, because I think, yeah, in the beginning, it's hard to tell... Well, it's hard for me to tell, like, is she just a more anxious and inclined kid? Or if she's picking up on, like, what you said, like, kind of bad vibes. Like, she's like, don't go through this tunnel, guys. Like, she's lagging behind her parents. She's Her mom says, don't cling to me. Like, she's, like, holding on to her mom really tightly when her parents go to eat the food. Like, she's not reassured at all by her parents' behavior. She's very, like, I don't know about this, guys. And, and which could be just her disposition. We don't know enough about her prior to the movie at all um or this is like you were saying she's picking up on like bad vibes like we're not supposed to be doing this i mean if we look at the theme of this movie it's that every time she listens to her instincts Mm -hmm. she's right yeah true 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 every time she follows what she's been taught by society like being polite being reserved being cautious Mm -hmm. being authentic Mm-hmm. Every time she follows those values that she's been taught her whole life, mm-hmm. we see her come out ahead regardless of what anybody else tells her. Every time she trusts in herself that what she knows to do is right, that's the solution to the problems. And I think that's one of the things that I really liked about watching this film and I think why it endures so long because this movie is 20 years old now. Mm-hmm. That why this is considered so powerful and why people like it so much is that you see this little girl have to accept that she, her answer is the right one and trusting in herself is okay to solve these problems regardless of what anybody else says or does. Absolutely. And mm-hmm. I feel like she does such a good job of, like, I feel like they're, what I really like about the character in general is that there didn't even really seem to be a um, a huge hesitation. Like initially she was trying to convince herself that it was a bad dream, which I think is a very normal, natural thing that any kid who is that age would do. But I feel like she really did once, once she kind of got past some of those pieces, she just started believing in herself. Like when she believed in herself about, um, Haku so easily and like was so consistent and persistent about what she believed about him to be true, which, which it, to me in the movie, I was like, I don't understand how she knows this. I don't understand how she's so confident about these choices that she's making. But like you said, Ben, I think it really is because she just had a feeling and she went with it instead of, I don't know, instead of being worried that it was right or wrong or whatever things that kids worry about. Well, and she's challenged throughout the film. Like how, yeah. many, how many characters tell her that Haku is a bad dude? All of them. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, Haku is her lackey. He's her apprentice. He's all of these bad things. And she's like, no, Haku is good. I believe Haku is good. Well, she got the benefit of kind of imprinting on him like a baby duck. Like, he was, like, the first person that she sort of encountered in this world that, like, took, like, that was kind to her. And, like, took care of her and kept her out of danger. Um, and so it makes sense. But, yeah, like, I think it is interesting. And even, like, watching the movie... How she is, I don't know how long the movie is in the sense of like how many, how much time has passes yeah. when she's in the spirit world, but her disposition from like, I keep thinking of the scene where she's on the stairs. Yeah. She's running down the stairs. And she, well, she, yeah, when she falls, kind of run falls down the stairs when he is like, you need to go down the stairs. You're going to run into the Kamachi Kamaji and you have to ask him for a job. And the way that she goes down the stairs to begin with, she's like clinging to the wall. <laughs> like she's like very, very scared and tentative. And I know she's in like a crazy place, like a totally absurd place. And so I understand, but even more than that, she just seems so, um so scared absolutely like overly like overly trying to keep herself safe understandably so um so it is interesting to watch her be so skittish then and like so 
also not one with her body like she does do a lot of yeah in the beginning klutzy stuff yeah and then as the movie gets on like goes on by the end of it she said she's almost like a totally different person yeah i I agree i think she goes through like this phase where she has to learn to trust in herself and to realize that everything that she has is enough Mm -hmm. that she can solve these problems she can do this she has the strength to do it and i think that's a really amazing thing to watch is that we don't have to watch her go through like this big growth of these things to happen to her for her to like grow into this it's that she has to just start believing in herself and turn it on right now or she's gonna die well, yeah yeah which is what i was just thinking of is she's also in like survival mode which does strip you down. Like, you don't have time to hesitate or doubt yourself. Like, this whole movie, she has going with the flow. <laughs> like, she's going from, like, one thing to the other. Because it never... This movie never slows down. Like, it is, like, one event situation with no stopping. Oh, yeah. no. No yeah. stopping whatsoever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But she does have really... You're right. Because, like, now I'm thinking about it, like... In terms of, like, the no face when she lets him in. Because there are, like, quiet, slow moments where she makes decisions which do seem rooted in her sense of self. Yeah. And that she's a she's yeah. a very altruistic-leaning person. Like, she's very... Um, for considering what's happened to her, she should be very guarded, very suspicious. Mm-hmm. But it does seem like her true intuition leans more towards um, believing in the good in people and altruism. And with the no face situation... She just is like, come inside. Like, mm-hmm. you look lonely out there. Where he looks scary. <laughs> like, I wouldn't have at her age been like, I'll open the door for you and leave it open because you've been weirdly following me around. <laughs> right. Yeah. There was a very Dracula moment. Yeah, he really gave me the willies. Yeah. I don't like when his little leg pops out from under his shadow thing. No. Yeah. No. It's Ooh. creepy. Like, it's very much that vampire energy where vampires have to be invited in in order to come in. And I think that that's. Unless there's Japanese folklore that I'm not aware of, which I'm aware of very little, so there's probably quite a lot. But, <laughs> you know, the Western folklore version of that is, struck to me was the mm-hmm. Bram Stoker's Dracula needing to be invited in in order to come mm-hmm. in. And, like, seeing that through that lens and going, oh, no, girl, don't invite mm-hmm. in the monster. And for her to go, I just thought he was a guest and I thought he needed to be in and I was trying to be polite. Mm-hmm. As mm-hmm. opposed to, like, there was no uh, none of, like, the manipulative energy that's always shown in Dracula the, of him hypnotizing and yes. manipulating the maids or the servants or whoever into inviting him in or Lucy. Mm-hmm. And there, there was none of that here. This was, the thing was looking kind of pathetic and alone. And she did turn into that altruism and that optimism and go, like, well, you know, they told me to be kind to the guests and to be welcoming and to be a good employee. So let me just... Mm-hmm. Let me just let him in. Well, and I feel like in a part of her is also that all everybody here are spirits and everybody looks, I would imagine if you look too hard, looks kind of just scary in general. Right. So I do feel like that she just knows that that's a fact of the people who come there in general, that, that they might, they're going to look different or they might feel scary, but that they're spirits and they're here for a reason. This is where they come to replenish. So I feel like her inviting, I think that it just makes a lot of sense. I think initially as a human who was sitting on the couch and watching it, I was like, Oh no girl, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but that in terms of what she was doing, I think you're absolutely right. She was listening to herself and be like, I was told to be kind to everybody who is here. This seems like a person who would want wants to come in to use the services here right who she doesn't know one from the other they're all scary like you said. yeah exactly exactly and i think that we see her go through this this change that is very empowering to i mean in particular 10 year old girls because that's who the director said he wrote it for he wrote it kind of inspired by the friends of the family that would come stay with him in his summer house mm-hmm so he would he had the opportunity to kind of watch 10-year-olds kind of engage and see how you know what things they might need to awaken from and realize that is very similar to what we tell clients all the time. I know what I tell clients all the time about anxiety and doing things is that you can't solve 10,000 steps ahead of where you are. It doesn't mm-hmm. work. It's a trap. It yeah. is an endless trap 
There are no answers. It is just your alert system being on and trying to give you some semblance of something that you can do to take control back over the world, and none of it will work because none of the things you pre-plan for are the things that are going to happen. And yeah. the and thing- no, and no matter how many, how long you think about it, how many options you think you have, it's not helpful and it's not going to be accurate and you're spending so much time being stuck in your head about all the different things that can happen right and all you're doing is perpetuating being in an alert state which means that you're not capable of thinking rationally so the solution to the problem much like many things is that rarely is the root cause of a problem also its solution and instead like what this director created with this film is creating a situation where they're showing that this girl had to trust in everything that she had to trust in her senses, to trust in her instincts, to trust in her teachings, to trust in her values. And that in doing that, you would have enough to solve each problem as it presents in the moment. And the only way you are going to be able to solve those problems successfully is being in the next moment. Which is exactly what I was gonna. Th- I was just thinking of, which is, and hearing you both talk about it, is she is like when I said she's very go with the flow. She's very present. All very present. Like she's only mm-hmm. really worried about, not even worried, but concerning herself with what's happening right now. Okay, now the stink spirit's coming. Okay, and so now I need to do this. Like she's because where anxiety, because anxiety isn't inherently bad. It keeps us safe in a lot of ways. It you know keeps us alert, helps us survive, all that kind of stuff. But where it really gets, starts really is, is, is unhelpful is like you were saying, when we get super out of the moment and we're projecting forward, like, don't they say like depression is when you're always in the past and anxiety is when you're always in the future. And so, Some and you have to work, that. yeah, and you have to work on being more in the present. And so I think, yes, yeah, she just is, really present all the time and she has every reason to be not like she could constantly be thinking about her parents and like what i gotta do with my parents and i don't i mean this could just be the magical of like the storytelling she that she's not and that she is more focused on just going through the like you said each moment as it occurs which is amazing for her to be able to do because very resilient she's extremely resilient and her parents are literally turned into pigs who she knows are pigs are being slaughtered yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i feel like in the fact that and like it would have been there's a whole other movie where all she's talking about and is worried about is about her parents the whole entire time she's asking people about it she's trying like i don't know how am i supposed to know that it's them like it constantly only worried about that one goal and i think what is magical about the movie and about the character and the story is that she's able to be present in a way that i don't think a we certainly don't see characters that age who act like that, but, but even less do we see females or people who present as female in those kinds of situations and are able to make decisions that are so, like you guys said, in the moment, like it's just wild. And how a lot of times, I mean, when we talk about, when we talk to clients about anxiety, we talk about being present, we talk about mindfulness, we talk about not that thinking about it for 25 minutes is not going to help manage anything. I mean, it's a good moral in the sense that if you just kind of concern yourself with the present, the longer term stuff will maybe work itself out. And also something I even use with myself because I have anxiety is especially if it's like late at night and I'm laying in bed and I'm like, about something. I usually just try to tell myself, can I do something about this literally right now? Can I literally do something about this problem right now? And usually, almost 99% of the time, the answer is no. And so it's I kind of give myself permission to put that on a shelf until I can do something about it. And it seems like that is what she's doing unconsciously through this whole movie is it's not it wouldn't help her to be fixated on her parents, you know? Nope. And she gives herself permission to to Mm -hmm. dismiss that and go, I hope they're okay, but... I have to do all these things in order to have a chance 
at yeah. rescuing them. Because the trick anxiety plays on you is thinking, if I think about this enough, for long enough, <laughs> and I think about all the scenarios, eventually I'll reach the end of the road where I'll solve it and I'll never have to worry about this or anything else ever again. And so... Yep. What you have to tell yourself, which is also what I tell myself when I, you know, in this example I gave about sleeping is I, it's not, there's never going to be a thing I figure out right now that's going to make my anxiety magically go away. So move on. Is it, it's a little easier said than done, but. Well, and I think about it in terms of it being like, we can't. I've lost my thought because I breathed heavy and <laughs> now I can't think about anything else because I know that people complain about how heavy I breathe. Um, <laughs> people be nice to Hannah and are heavy, heavy breathing. <laughs> it's for dramatic uh, effect. Yeah, apparently. Um, fuck. I'll, I'll come back. That's what I talk about with my dramatic pauses that I usually edit out is, Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> Hannah's heavy breathing. I dramatically paused and, Brittany said she's not going to get into it, and then she got real deep into it. <laughs> so we'll just make fun of ourselves real quick. Anyway, um, yeah, I think, well, Hannah, when your thought comes back, let yeah, me know. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know. I know that not everybody listens to every one of our episodes, so you know, I'll kind of go a little bit into the anxiety factor that we've been talking about here, is that really what happens is when your brain detects a threat, you have to remember that our threat system was designed to deal with fucking tigers. Yeah. Yes. Like a uh, fucking what stegosaurus? <laughs> no, we weren't around when stegosaurus were around. I don't S- fucking saber tooth tigers. Yeah. Mastodons. Yeah. Right. Right. Mastodons, saber tooth tigers. So the thing you have to remember is that every one of these problems you start analyzing, your brain is going, "What do I do about this fucking tiger?" It's not categorizing or ranking or putting in in any sort of context because once the threat system in your mind activates the ability to rationally process things is irrelevant to survival and turns off or significantly diminishes its level of functioning because your brain kind of like when you think about sci-fi movies and whether you have enough power in the ship to run the shields and the guns and the engines and mm-hmm. the nav computer all at once, or do you have to go, well, let's put double front up on the, the shields hyperdrive. right now. The right. Fucking hyperdrive is always a problem. Right. Always, always a fucking problem. And when you think about your brain, you have to realize that what's happening is that your brain is going, ah, we only have enough power to run so many systems at base level, but this area that's detecting threat needs more power than the front, the neofrontal cortex lobe of our brain. And we need to deal with this motherfucking tiger right here because it's going to eat us. And let me tell you what your survival brain does not think that your irrational ass mind does think, which is, you know, if Mr. Tiger were to eat me and someone saw that my room was a mess, I would just die. I couldn't handle it that if I died and got eaten and Mr. Tiger, he ate me and then somebody found all of my embarrassing shit in my room and then saw that I didn't make my bed. I just couldn't handle it. So I just like, Mr. Tiger, I need you to hold on a second so that you don't eat me so I can go make my bed. And then if you need to eat me, so be it. But I need to make my bed first because I just couldn't bear it. Let me tell you what your brain does not do. <laughs> What I think is what I think is so awesome about this is I've literally thought that before. Not about the tiger part, but like, oh, but then everyone will see how much of a messy bitch I am. And like and it's like what well, nobody A, who fucking cares? And B, that's not it's not going to change anything. It's not going to change anything and being in the present is the only way that we can because thinking about the future and worrying about it, like things change too much. They change too often. You can't and anticipate everything. We can't, and you can't anticipate a fucking thing. We don't control anything except for the way that we respond to our feelings and emotions. That's it. We don't control anybody else. We don't control the fucking weather or the traffic or when we get sick. We don't control anything. So trying to figure out a plan for every fucking thing that could happen is not... It's not helpful. It's just, it's not helpful. And I know that, look, I'm struggling with some pretty intense anxiety over the last couple of months myself. And, and my brain has been worrying about so many things that are so much in the future that I can't even see it clearly. So I know that this isn't something that's easy, but I think what was so 
refreshing about this movie is how much she was able to be in the present and how much different of a character we had who was able to just do what was in front of her. Like she knew that she had a lot of challenges. She knew that some of the relationships she had were going to be affected by that. She knew that she was going to have to make hard choices and she went with it and she did the best that she could instead of worrying about, well, what if I take this piece of coal from these little fuzzy, cute things that look like spiders? Yeah. Um, (laughs) What will happen? No, she's just doing, she's like, oh, I'm supposed to be helping. I'm supposed to be trying to figure out how to do work. I will do this and let's see what happens. Like, like yeah. and instead of what's happening to my parents, where are my parents at? What am I going to do about that? Like, just, it's such a big shift. I don't know. I'm, I'm done talking. No, it, it, <laughs> it, it is a big shift. And like looking at all that, like putting it back into like my world of tigers, right? I, yes. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> like, cause it all ties in is like going back to that. Like she was able to recognize that these are all fucking tigers and nothing else matters. Yes. Which I thought was a beautiful way that Miyazaki represented all this in all the art that he did is that this is a story about dealing with legit dangers that are there right now and having to trust all of that and recognizing that there is no utility in being in the part of your mind that essentially spins three big wheels of trying to find the way to solve a problem. So what what happens when your brain enters the threat mode that I was talking about is that it immediately suspends the usefulness of timestamps in the data that's stored in your mind because time is no longer relevant because any information that helps you survive the tiger attack is useful. So mm-hmm. space and time loses relevance so that means if you start spinning a wheel in your head that has all the past files you start spinning that going well this situation might be like this one that happened then which then you start spinning the wheel of now going and that's also like this situation is happening right now and then you start spinning the infinite wheels of the future and going well if this happens then that happens and if that happens like this then that might happen and if that happens like this then that happens that could be like this time that that happened and that's happening now but this is happening then and i don't know what to do with now but this is happening then and all that stuff and you know what happens when you get into that space you get paralyzed. Yes. All that you do is sit into situations and try to figure out how do I solve all of this with one situation? Like Brittany was talking about, if I just do it the right way, Mm -hmm. the first time I will solve all of the problems and then there won't be any more problems. Yeah. And that doesn't work. It's helpful to recognize the irrational. It's helpful to recognize the irrational beliefs or thoughts that come with anxiety and cause it can be, <laughs> I at least can find it kind of, and I think when I work with clients too, it can be kind of embarrassing to realize like how, um, much like that you can like wind it down to like one thought. Like if I just do this every, I'll never feel bad again. And then when you say it out loud, you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, that, like, like, we're humans. What? And like, this... I know that's not true, but that's the power of our, our, what we would call your emotion mind in that moment. Like, there's a DBT concept called wise mind. And the idea is that you have your emotion mind and your logic mind, and your emotion mind is how it sounds. It's where all your feelings are and, like, your symptoms and your anxieties. And then your logic mind is obviously, like, where you think logically. And I think sometimes I have to tell myself, or, or when I'm working with clients, is, okay, we're in our emotion mind. Logic does not live there. So, you know, and so I think sometimes, but we, we can convince ourselves that we are thinking logically when we're actually in our emotion mind. So I think being able to separate the two can be really helpful to challenging, like you were saying, um, ben that anxiety like the thoughts that come with it like i am controlling it by thinking about a lot because what well, yep. i think i think what's important to note is that she's still making decisions and she still has power she does and so giving up control in the sense of the anxiety way does not mean and saying where she's being present going with the flow doesn't mean that she's not making decisions and powerful decisions like she's making really strong risky you know values based decisions this whole movie yep especially with the stink spirit scene like where she like everybody else nobody else wants to deal with no one's to do those things she's trusting her instinct that something's wrong that this is not what it seems that there's something stuck in him and we need to help him he needs help or even like going to zaniba's 
you know, going on the train yep. to help Haku when he is, you know, hurt. And, and those are really like, quote unquote, like scary decisions. And, but she, she isn't being driven by her anxiety and therefore her, th- her decisions are more thoughtful as well. Because our decisions when we're anxious, like you were saying, they're not great decisions because they're coming from a franticness. Even if we don't seem frantic, our brain is responding to franticness. It is. It is absolutely doing so. And like I use that phrase of that, you know, rarely is the root cause of a problem also its solution when I talk to people about substance use a lot. Mm-hmm. But I feel like anxiety is the same because we give in to kind of the same types of things. What I mean by that is we've all either done this or known someone who has done this where someone goes, and there's a great song about it. It's called uh, from Afro Man. (laughs) 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 Because I got high. I was going to go to school, but then I got high. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's, Mm -hmm. it's, that whole story that he goes through in that song about all of these things that he had these plans to do and all the things. But then he fucked it up because he got high. But then in order to deal with what he f- lost because he fucked up because he got high, he gets high again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we have seen this all with this. We, we've all seen the guy who's like, oh, man, my wife got mad at me because I got drunk, but I can't deal with her bitching. So I got to get drunk so that, you know, mm-hmm. you know, I can, yeah. I, can, I can just process the bitching and I can and zone out of it. And you're stuck in a cycle that you never break free from. And then guess what? She gets mad again because you got drunk again mm-hmm. and did some dumb shit or said some mean shit. And then she's bitching again. And then you got to drink again. Yeah. And then, like, it goes through this, like, endless cycle of, like, oh, well, you know. It, it's not the alcohol, though. It's, it's her bitching. Right. Yeah. It's not that I made poor decisions and I kept drinking. Mm-hmm. It, it's that she just needs to leave me alone or my kids need to leave me alone. My boss needs to just leave me alone. Let me do my thing. And I'll, if they just didn't stress me out, I wouldn't have to drink. Yeah. But because they stress me out and that's the only thing that helps me de-stress and I now I have to drink. Yep. And you just, you see that and Afro Man did it hilariously in the song, but the same thing happens with the way we think when we're anxious is going, if I think about it the right way, I find the end of the rainbow. Like Brittany was mm-hmm. talking about it because there is one right solution in this matrix of yes. problems. And what needs to happen in order for me to solve it is that I've just been doing it wrong the whole time. And that's my fault. So I have to think about it the right way so that I get the right solution so that I do it right the first time the only time and I never mis- make the mistake and then I can stick it to everyone and say you know what I was right the whole time I knew it I knew it and I got it and I had it in me and I got it <laughs> and guess what that moment comes you know the, that moment doesn't come no, I don't think I don't think that moment ever comes I was gonna say it c- comes about <laughs> as often as we find that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow exactly but then I started thinking about lucky charms and my brain left <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, because <laughs> I thought about a skit from my comedy days and thought tricks are for me, bitch, and then my brain left. <laughs> That's fair. That, really, um, just really quickly, I just wanted to. Um, there's a video, a really short. It's like a three, three, four minute video by Russ Harris called "The Happiness Trap." And it's the evolution of the human mind, and it's so interesting. It's really short, and the um, the animation is really cute. But it really kind of speaks exactly to what we're talking about, starting from when that the brains that evolved are the brains that were able to do all the risk assessment. Mm -hmm. And that because we no longer have to do that intensive of a risk assessment anymore, but we have more data coming in. So before they were only worried about the tiger or they were worried about surviving and that was the only thing they could worry about. And now we see that the brain that got, got evolved to where we are now is from that brain so that we just don't have, and this is something that everybody deals with. Yep. This is not something that like, oh, I have anxiety or Brittany has anxiety. This is everybody's brain is like this. And what I really like about the video is that it just does it so succinctly in terms of explaining some of the things that we're talking about. So just something to check out. Russ Harris is also someone who writes a lot about um, acceptance and commitment therapy. Which I talked about in our uh, Return of the Jedi episode. You did. Because <laughs> ACT is wonderful. Yeah, it is it wonderful. Is. I, I am a big fan of that modality. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think it's 
just what we've been talking about, I hope what you take from that is that you're hearing three therapists try to explain to you that, look, you can't beat anxiety with irrationally thinking about the things that make you anxious. <laughs> and what Hannah is saying is, uh, echoing what I was talking about, is that the way I learned it is, look, our brains, the base brainstem is pretty much the same brainstem that every creature on the earth has and every single creature has subconscious functions that keep us alive keep us breathing respond to threats if you back a dog into a corner it is the same response you get if you back a lizard into a corner if you back a cat into a corner if you back a human being into a corner they're going to get uncomfortable they're going to get aggressive they're going to start pushing back they're going to try to get away all of those things happen immediately because our brains are all built from the back to the front as far as evolution and guess where our neofrontal cortex lives the bear the physical part of your brain that is most responsible for your ability to use foresight insight and determine the logical process of things using your wise mind as Brittany said that part lives right behind your forehead which is the most evolutionarily advanced part of the brain so when you retreat into earlier parts of functioning, more primal states, you are using earlier parts of the brain that exist in all creatures. So these problems are not, you can solve this by thinking about it more. No, you are now in lizard brain and are not capable of thinking about it rationally. Therefore, thinking about it more is happening in an irrational emotional state in the emotion mind that Brittany is it, what is it, emotional mind is that what they it's, use uh, well it's emotion mind and logic mind emotion mind logic but I think mind. sometimes it's called rational mind which has like a a not, not, it, a, not the great. context of saying rational is a little not great not yeah. helpful sure I people react too much to they, that I mean they do it's been, been used through the language of CBT for so long that it's time to co-opt the language so it doesn't become shame-based. Yes. I get you. Yes. Yeah. That makes sense. Because when a treatment starts using it and then people... Gets into the zeitgeist, people use it wrong, then it becomes yes. shaming. And we can talk about that later because that's a whole nother wormhole. But yeah. Yes, it is. The, <laughs> not to get too deep into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You see what I did there? Batman. I did. <laughs> but Ew. anyway... Um, the the thing to remember is that when you're in that part of your brain, you are no longer capable of assigning time values, rational thoughts, anything to it until you restore your body to a state of calm functioning that tells your body you don't need to be in threat processing mode right now because you got this. And what we see out of Chihiro in this movie is that she finds ways to convince herself that if I trust in myself, if I do the things that I know are right, if I listen to my instincts, I don't need to be in this threat processing mode where I'm running around scared because I will be okay if I do things the way I know I need to. And it is kind of wild that she, which might be more of the fairy tale nature of the movie or like what you were saying, how it's written to be like a an empowering message for young girls, which is that everyone, she shouldn't feel this empowered. Everybody in this world is telling her that she's like a dope literally. And that she is like a gross human. Like there's no one who is Lynn becomes a sorter for her, but there's no one who's like pumping her up really. Nope. Even Haku who is on her side the whole movie. He's not, he's still not like, he's tough loving her at best. Like he's yeah, like, figure absolutely. it out. Because he's more, I think in that anxious state of like, but he's also probably been abused. Like we don't know a lot about Haku. Um, other than he is the spirit of a river, which took my breath away <laughs> when that happened to me. I was like, I could not have guessed that in a thousand years. Um, but He's a bit more cynical and jaded, but he's also been there longer. He's the apprentice of a very evil person. So, and also yeah. I think he lost his parents 
Like it. Oh no, because he's a river. Oh god, well, he that's never right. had parents. Unless he's you count a river. Like, I forgot. I forgot. Yeah, I forgot. The worst. I remember thinking that when I was watching it before we knew that he was a river. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. But he no, he just has a very different environment happening. So I mean, I think this kind of we've been talking about it sort of, but shifting into like the empowerment part of this discussion is the sense of what you were saying, Ben, of a lot of anxiety is, um, what am I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with me? And if I can just figure that question out, like that big question, then everything will be solved. And so empowerment is obviously reversing that and kind of living more in a state of, in a belief of like, well, nothing's wrong with me. And like you were saying before, like, I have everything I have, I, everything I need, I have already. And so I think what's what's lovely about this movie and the messaging of it in Chihiro is that you can, without her real, it's so naturalistic for her to feel more and more empowered as movies going along because each, each decision she's making intuitively is being rewarded. And even the ones that aren't, like, no face, like, she definitely could have taken that as, I really fucked up. Yeah, she you know, and, she, and, oh, and she's literally and she's, eating people. Yeah, and she's I mean, treated that way. <laughs> but I think that's the part of her. If you're going to continue with the empowerment, and the intuitive message is that she. I think she even says this. I knew if I did this to No Face, he would regurgitate the people. <laughs> like I think there's yeah. a part of her who was that was still thinking he didn't really kill them. Yes. Like, or hurt them. Well, no, because it's their voices starting to come out of him, and he's taking on the forms of everybody he eats. Yeah, but she's but she's trusting that. That She's trusting that out. that's what's happening. Or that it'll all work out if she makes certain decisions. And if she approaches him with direct kindness, which is kind of her MO the whole movie. Yes. And so so she has a lot of opportunities and she's told a lot like you are f- a fuck up. And she just continues to trust herself. And I think what true empowerment does look like is that, which I think Brene Brown talks about with like wholeheartedness versus shame is that when you when something happens badly it's it's you you can take it as a separate from yourself like i made a mistake versus i'm a bad person and so i think you know and now talking this through she does have that wholeheartedness that Brene Brown talks about which is when something happens that's not good and people are even blaming her she does not internalize it no she does not Mm-mm. Which is what, yeah, Brene Brown talks about if you're a wholehearted person, basically an empowered person, a self-compassionate person, you can separate your decisions and your mis- your quote-unquote mistakes from yourself, your identity, which is really hard to do. Yes. But I guess it's doable if you talk to Brene Brown. <laughs> and of course, I believe it's doable as a therapist. But I think you do see that in If you kind talk of- to Brittany Brownfield, LCPC, yes. it is doable. Yes. Um, professionally go see her yes. she's awesome <laughs> thank you but um but i think yeah shihiro is kind of that in action mm-hmm. you know and even when she she gets really screamed at by yababa about no face and she goes in like she's very i did like how she was just like you gotta quit dude <laughs> like her energy when she goes <laughs> to no face she's like come on guy you like, can't this isn't the look <laughs> you, Wait, gotta, like, you gotta go <laughs> what, what, what are you doing <laughs> yeah yeah. I, yeah. I think it's it's amazing to see that even in all of that, when everyone's encouraging her to mm-hmm. just take the gold or just take these things from that she never takes anything more than what she needs. She's very values based. She is, but that's also like a like a very environmentalistic kind of message of taking only what you need yeah. and using only what you need and not taking anything in excess. And there are many examples of uh, there being traps like that throughout history. Like one comes to mind of a a legend about Vlad Dracul, since vampires are on my mind today. (laughs) Apparently. You don't know this one? I don't know. Vlad the Impaler, uh, a thing that he uh, was famous for was impaling people Mm -hmm. on spikes Mm -hmm. who did wrong in his kingdom and he got quite liberal with that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the there's a story about a person who reported that money had been stolen from him. And mm-hmm. he went to the court and said, you know, I was I was robbed. This money was stolen from him. And then 
when he was they found the people who stole his gold, the highway robbers, and impaled them. And they asked him to, you know, count his money and make sure it's all there. And it was one gold piece over. And he handed that piece back. And Vlad said, ah, that's good. Because had you taken that extra piece of gold, I would have impaled you too. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Crap. Because then you'd be lying. Yes. And, like, that, that kind of theme exists within this story of, like, you see her being presented with... The monster's trying to give her and everybody else like everything else that they might need to make their lives easier, even though for other people it's all bullshit. For her, it was those tokens. It was all the gold turned to mud anyway, mm-hmm. which I laughed at. Yeah, me too. Um, but the like the process you see of her like not taking a single thing more than what she needs and staying true to her message the whole time, I think is fascinating despite everybody else going, no, 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 take the gold, take the gold. Help us. You have to pay back your debt. Well, I think also one thing to acknowledge, though, is that um, there is deep anxiety that comes from scarcity yep. and especially systemic, you know, like scarcity that comes from systemic oppression. And in this bathhouse, there's very clear like systemic oppression happening. Like, oh, very clear. And yeah. like Lynn talks about it, too, of this, like, I just I'm working so hard to get out of here. To, I'm one day I'm going to get on the train. And so. They do come off as very greedy. Like, I think it's kind of how they're presented. Like, all the people that work at the bathhouse. Like, I will let this guy, like, shit in my mouth for yeah some gold. You right. know what yeah. I mean? Basically. And and they're kind of being kind portrayed of as, like... What you've been looking at on the internet? <laughs> well, I mean, like, they're basically, like... What they say? Like, I oh, let's make his butt bigger so I can keep kissing it. Like, they're yeah, they degrading themselves. Like, yeah. Yeah. basically. And, and so, I think... I definitely can understand if we're going to go off this, this concept that Chihiro is someone who is just somehow elevated above anxiety, that she is not touched by that scarcity anxiety, which I would imagine the other people, even though like they're portrayed as more greedy, you can de- like, you can definitely see as they are anxious because they have the, of that scarcity. Like we have to get this now because we have so little, we're so trapped. Like this is our opportunity to get out of here and to get up. And I think that is very true. Like that's a really true feeling where people can get like that hoard. Like when I work with fam, like when I've worked with kids who come from neglectful households and things like that, they do, they can do what can, what's considered odd behaviors like hoard food in their room, even though they're being fed enough by like their caregivers and caregivers are always like, why do they do that? And I'm like, it's because it's the anxiety from being in an oppressive situation makes you feel like you're always in a state of scarcity. So any opportunity to, to collect resources, you, you go a little, you know, for lack of a better term, like bonkers with it. Like you can't regulate it. It's a more therapeutic way to say that. And so you do like, it is this anxious in the moment energy of I'm going to collect and hoard, which I do think you see them. I don't know if that's what he meant to p- portray other than it might've been more the, the simpler message of like you were saying, Ben, cause I think there's a lot of like, there's a lot of environmentalism values portrayed in this movie, like the pollution and the one river spirit. And then obviously like Haku, like stopped becoming a river because he was, um, paved over, paved over and made an apartment complex, I think is what he said. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I don't know if he went, if, if Miyazaki was meaning to talk about that in that scene, it seemed a oh, he's always, dude, there's always environmental that. themes but, in the movies, but in terms of like the scarcity thing, but I think that's the part where I try to remind myself to have compassion. Um, when those kind of behaviors come, like come up, like you have to really be, be thoughtful about where people are coming from. And though I think, Chihiro is obviously in a very anxious spot now in the sense of her power. She also probably before now was pretty taken care of. Oh yeah. Her parents are driving an Audi. She's fine. So I think that's, and that could also be, so we always have to be mindful of that as a contributing factor to her current presentation. Yeah. Like I've never needed anything really in terms of that. Right, but she needs now. But even then, she's she's used to being provided for, like you said. And I think that is a very valuable point. And I did not consider that. No, I didn't think about that either. Mm-hmm. I actually thought more that they were just kind of um, enchanted in the same way that her parents kind yeah, of possibly. got stuck in terms of once they took any of the gold, that then they became... 
um, like irrationally only like excited about the gold, like that it was some kind of the same idea of when you take something or asking someone to come in that then you're agreeing to something. So I kind of took it like that, but I think that's a really great point. Um, it makes a lot of sense in terms of what, even just how we see them live just kind of in general. Well, I mean, I think it's a common theme too with like Yababa, <coughs> like she's keeping everyone down that works for her. Mm-hmm. She's hoarding up in her little penthouse. Mm-hmm. She's hoarding all the jewels and stuff like that. And even like with her, gigantic weird baby <laughs> i don't really understand the backstory to she's also hoard even hoarding him in the sense of like and using fear yeah, yeah. to control yeah her baby as mm-hmm. well yeah and so i think that is also to keep in mind yeah with like the way that these people present because like lynn she's really hard in the beginning and then she's pretty quickly pretty soft in a sweet way well, I also felt like she, which also kind of seems like a, like what the environment is, is that everybody's just a little bit mean. And mm-hmm. then once you get them alone or once they're in a space that's more protected, they're able to kind of be kind mm-hmm. because that's kind of what I felt like was happening, especially like Haku had a similar thing where he kind of didn't treat her very well when he was in front of Yababa. But I think that is because that was a part of the role that he had to play to survive. And so, and Lynn was mean when she was in front of people, but then when she took her to the side and was like, hey, let's get you some clothes. Like, oh, this is too big. Like she wasn't, um, she wasn't as maybe friendly, but she Mm -hmm. was still kinder to her when it was just the two of them. Yeah. So I feel like, and I feel like that's kind of more of, and also getting a better sense of, of how, Chihiro sees herself because I think she had, they have an idea of what a human is like Mm -hmm. an idea of like how they can be bratty and like they don't ever do anything and they smell bad and all these things like they're worthless and they're worthless. Right. So she kind of has that. And when she kind of gets to know her a little, even just a little bit, she automatically realizes that no, like this person is a hard worker, like they're intelligent, they're caring. And I feel like she, I feel like that's why her shift is so quick. Yeah, and I think all those are valuable. And I've been just right now doing some research to provide some cultural context to it that we're all obviously lacking. Lacking, yeah. Because <laughs> none of us have been... Exp- I don't think I've learned a thing about Shinto since I took world history in AP world history when I was 17 years old. Uh, and... Uh, yeah. No. So some, this is... I'm going to pull straight from Wikipedia here because it's the resource I could find quickly. But in Shinto... Kami are not separate from nature since the the spirit world that they're right. in is in the world of the Kami. Um, are not separate from nature, but are of nature, possessing positive and negative good and evil characteristics. Um, they are manifestations of Musubi, uh, which is the interconnecting energy of the universe and are considered exemplary of what humanity should strive towards. Kami are believed to be hidden from this world and inhabit a contemporary existence or complementary existence that mirrors our own uh, to be in harmony with the awe inspiring aspects of nature is to be conscious of the way of the Kami. So if that's a cultural value that yes, she would have that we're ignorant to because this is an entire religion and philosophy that we're not familiar with, it would make a lot of sense why she would have these values so deeply rooted into her and why it's so important to the story that she's staying adherent to these and maintaining an attitude of balance that things can be either good or evil depending Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on how you interact with them and the importance of being one with nature, which we see her being more mindful of than some of the other characters. And it's part of where her faith in herself and her skills, if she just adheres to these notions that makes sense yeah Mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely and i would say yeah um touching upon the theme of empowerment and kind of the flip side of what we've been saying so far is that um the flip side of being so well provided for like we've been talking about is that um something i see a lot as someone who works with children and teenagers um almost exclusively is that when we are too provided for by our family and parents, 
we don't really have a sense of ourselves. We're not very empowered within ourselves because yeah. we have a lot of decisions made for us, a lot of problems solved for us. And so, and you can see in the beginning of the movie when she's like clinging to her mom and she's wanting her parents to like make some choices. And then when they make a choice, she just follows after them. And so in the beginning of the movie, as the movie, well, as the movie progresses, I think what occurs is that because she doesn't have parental figures making decisions for her or telling her what to do, she is having to grow that internal um, compass and like that internal intuition to kind of help her trust herself, which is really hard to do, if not impossible, when you have parents or a family system that is constantly taking away what I kind of, this is the line I use, which you can steal if you like, which is when I have parents who really jump in a lot for the kids I work with and either um, enable them or accommodate them or, or even like come in and like save them from like a, a bad, fe- like quote unquote bad feeling or failure, which I understand the instinct to save your child from something distressing. What I say, which I stole from someone else, is <laughs> you're robbing your child opportunities to tolerate frustration. And you can even go out from that which is that you're robbing your children opportunities to problem solve, to deal with distress, to understand that they can survive distress. Um, I see, and I know that all generations are reactions to the previous generation, especially when it comes to parenting. And so I know that um, like our, like my, I don't even want to say my parents' parents, but because I think it, it's less generations than that. Very like, your kid went out to play and you saw them at dinner time or you come home when the street lights go out. And then I think a reaction to that and what I see a lot now in the work I do is parents who are very involved in their kids' lives and very much like don't want them to fail, you know, really try to save them from distressing situations. And it, and I'll, well, I guess I'll say this is kind of me being a smart ass, but they're still coming to see me. So you haven't saved them from debilitating anxiety, sadness, anything that is interrupting their life and causing them genuine emotional distress. We're still ending up in the same place and maybe even arguably worse. The greatest teacher failure oh, Benjamin. is. Benjamin. <laughs> I know someone listening I to I was me. not. I, know I someone... knew that you were going to say something. I did not fucking expect Yoda's voice to come out of your mouth. That was amazing. Um, and I, <laughs> um, and I feel like, and I feel like Brittany, I feel like something that I say a lot to people is that you have to give someone a chance to learn what they need to know. And that we, and that the world has all of the emotions and you cannot protect someone from experiencing that No, in a way because we have to learn to deal with things that we don't like. I mean, if you ask any adult, that's an experience that they're having about something. Because also, there's always stuff that we don't like. And that's something we have to learn to manage versus lean into and decide that now we're not going to do anything about it. Because it's because we just don't want to and there aren't any other options. It's very rigid. It's a very rigid way of living. And it's hard because they really need a part of... I was... Um, when I was growing up in the summertime, I would spend a lot of time with my grandparents and we would go outside, we would have breakfast and get dressed. And she would say, I'll ring the bell when it's lunchtime. And they had, and they had, um, like a baseball field and like, I mean, we had, um, a lot of space space that was safe for us to be in because we're out in the country in the middle of fucking nowhere. Um, so we had a lot of space to be able to do that. But that part of that was when we got into squabbles about something, we would have to figure it out. Or if we needed to problem solve how to fix something, or this is what we want to do and we have to figure it out. And it was a safe way of being able to do that Mm -hmm. and being able to have those natural experiences at an age where I can help understand that, wow, there might be, especially if I ask someone, but also if I just come up with ideas myself, those ideas might just work. Mm -hmm. And that not giving your child a chance to learn that when they will be in a world 
A, eventually without you, period. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and just in the world in general, you can't protect them from being in the world. Well, because a part of it, too, is you have to be mindful, like, are you raising an adult, like you're saying, Hannah, who can't self-manage? Are you raising an adult who doesn't learn how to do things for themselves? Because eventually your kid's going to become an adult. <laughs> and if you're solving all their problems for them, what are they going to do? And I think part of it to be aware of as a parent, kind of back to what we were talking about with anxiety, is I think there's also, I'm not a parent myself, so I can't speak, I can only speak to this anecdotally, but and what I experience working with parents is that it's like a similar anxiety of if I just anticipate all the problems my kid will face and figure it out, they'll live a perfect life. It's like the same thing of like, they'll finally be an end of the road Mm -hmm. and like they'll live the perfect life and they'll never have to feel deep heartache or anxiety or shame or whatever. And that's the part of the human existence. I mean like things, the good feels so good because we also experience the not so good. Right. They, we want to smooth the road for them so mm-hmm. that they don't have to go through the struggles that we did mm-hmm. without realizing that it was the struggles that allowed us to grow beyond our parents. Because also like a, a buzzy thing I think that parents talk about now culturally is like, why are these kids so entitled? And so, like, you know what I mean? Whatever. Because they're like, given well, everything. Well, I'm like, well, you raise them. So don't look at these kids like they came out of the womb just like a selfish piece of shit. Like, yeah. they're a product of their environment. And collectively, if they're, if they're that way, you need to put a mirror up to your own face. And then also, like you mm-hmm. were just saying, Ben, if you don't have the... Dis- if you don't have the hard parts of life, not super hard, but just hard parts of life, that puts the good things in perspective... The, the good things become the neutral. Right. And so then for things to feel good, you have to go above good. Right. Because you know what? I will tell you. You know when I learned that tennis rackets can become snowshoes? What? When I walked to school uphill both oh ways God. in a snowstorm <laughs> without shoes, my parents only gave me... <laughs> I'm trying to break Hannah right now. That's, that's working. <laughs> I'm just watching Hannah die. <laughs> but, but yeah. No, but like, like, like you, the, mm-hmm. the moment you, that you learn that you can solve problems and that if you strap a tennis racket to your foot that you don't sink in the st- you know, mm-hmm. 12-foot snow is when your parents mm-hmm. said, hey, guess what? I have to go to work. My yeah. boss doesn't give a shit that you have a snow day. Go to school. Mm-hmm. Or you're going to your friend's house or whatever it was. And they're like, don't sink in the snow. Bye. Mm-hmm. This is not a thing that happens anymore. Mm-hmm. yeah and um and i think like getting into a bigger concept which you can definitely do more research on if you're interested is um the concept of like free range parenting um which was pioneered not too long ago by lenore skenazy i'm not quite sure i said her last name it's spelled s-k-e-n-a-z-y um if you want to like a quick understanding of it outside of like wikipedia how did this get made has a good podcast episode about it and dak shepherd's podcast also interviews her and she has a good job talking through all the parts of it um and basically the idea is what we've been talking about and kind of what you were even referencing hannah is is reintroducing the idea of letting your kids figure stuff out on their own within reason obviously like even when she talks about it she's like don't just like throw your kids out there and neglect them or abandon them or mistreat them it's more like you were saying hannah which is kind of how i was sort of raised and definitely our parents were raised which is you go out and you figure stuff out for yourself within reason like if you go out on your bikes you hang out with the kids in the neighborhood if you get into a fight or you play a game and there's conflict around that fight, don't jump in as the parent and try to solve that conflict for your kids. Let them figure it out. The worst thing that happens is that they don't talk, they get in a fight with their friends, like a verbal thing. You know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of times too, and this is more, I guess, treatment. Little kids will hit. (laughs) But even then they'll get through that. But like, Every three year old um, she hit, they'll hit. But well, you wouldn't all free range parent a three year old either, within reason. Well, no, because <laughs> she's too little. They're yeah, t- too little. Yeah, but so it's basically too like cute. I can't. <laughs> I'm. I don't know the whole ages where they talk about, but I think you you do it in like obviously stages when you want to intentionally do this. Yeah, but is like if you have slightly older kids, like probably between like seven and up, 
like they can figure stuff out like you are letting because those active like play like mr rogers is very into that um is ways that kids figure out adult things they figure out their feelings they figure out interpersonal relationship stuff Mm -hmm. they learn how to have conflict they learn how to problem solve they learn to resolve things they learn to not get their way and then learn to deal with the distress of that these are all very natural organic developments that we rob our children of when we shelter them And when we save them from these opportunities, because also what you're also showing your child indirectly is I don't trust you to figure this out for yourself. I don't trust that you can handle this for yourself. And then kids do internalize that. I mean, like there's the joke that millennial, like not millennials, but like that Gen Z's will scream at someone for about social justice, but then can't make their own dental appointments. Like, (laughs) but it's that thing of sad, but true, but it's that thing of like, you, you don't feel like you can do things for yourself in that way, in a functional way, because maybe your parents have always done it for you. And then I work with families where, Parents are like, oh, my God, I have this kid who's going off to college. They don't know how to do anything. And so... I don't know who I am. Yeah. I don't know who I am. Well, and, and, or yeah. they, I'm going to move down there to college with them. <laughs> well, and I also, some banana shit I've seen. Well, and also I feel like in the difference between having a 13-year-old kid learn something versus having an adult child have to learn something where they're now involved with the legal system. And yeah. now we're like, you want a kid to learn a lesson when they're six or when they've been in jail twice? Like, let's, you can't expect that they are going to automatically know something because they're 18. That's Mm -hmm. not how shit works. We have to give them a chance to learn those different things at different in different ways so that you can have an adult who knows how to deal with stuff when it's hard, who knows how to, you know, be able to manage any of those, any of those feelings. It is. And you know what? I'm going to give you guys three great examples that we have seen of this in media. The first is Haku. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Haku, in this film, does that with her. He tells her what to do, not how to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he goes like, this is what you have to do. And he trusts her to figure it out. He's like, go down there, talk to Kamaji, insist you get a job. Don't take no for an answer. And and when, what's the witch's name? Yubaba? Yubaba. He he tells her with Yubaba, and so does uh, Lynn, that she's going to be mean to you. She's going to be all these things. You stand up to her. Mm -hmm. You get a job. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter what she does you get a job you get a job because if you don't get a job you won't survive here so go get a job and then that's it which is the george Patton method of leading which is tell people what to do not how to do it and let them surprise you with the results absolutely which is okay which is one of my favorite leadership quotes of Mm -hmm. like i don't want to micromanage you when i am the leader i don't want to be in your business i want you to you use your talents to be you to solve the problem and do things. Come to me if you need help. You get stuck somewhere. I will help you. But I don't want to be all up in your business telling you how to do your job. Because if I didn't think you could do your job, I wouldn't have hired you. Exactly. And I think... Well, and I... Oh. Sorry to... Sorry, I have one more thought in the middle. It's okay. Um, people talk so often about teenagers and how moody they are. Part of the reason why teenagers are so moody, one of the first things... If I want to connect with someone immediately... Uh, especially a teenager, I'll say something like, it probably feels like they just don't trust you, huh? Mm-hmm. And that works every time. Every fucking time. Every because time. teenagers and kids internalize that because when you do things for them, that that the message that they're getting is that they can't do it by themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is not a message that is internalized in a healthy in any kind of healthy way, because it's not a healthy way to feel. Like, that's not, that doesn't help them feel empowered. That doesn't mm-hmm. help them in giving them a chance. I had this kind of um, magical moment when I spent uh, time with my family where my brother and his daughter, she was scared about getting, like, thrown into the water, um, even though he was close the water wasn't that deep and she said no no I don't want to I don't want to and he and so finally he just kind of did it where he like we he worked up to it she was so happy 
after she did it once. And she's like, I, I did it. I could do it. And it was OK. And she said, I feel like I could do anything. And it was just one of those moments that like exactly because we needed to give her a chance in a safe way to just be able to do it. And he didn't tell her and didn't like do this or do that. He's like, well, let's try this and let's try this and then get to a point where they can make that decision and say, yes, this is what I want to do. And then she felt amazing. She was like a little sparkling um, little person for the rest of the day because she did something and it made her feel really good and like she could do anything. And fuck, isn't that the feeling we want kids to have? And isn't that why this movie was written? Yeah. Because that's exactly what your hero got through. And when Mm -hmm. people give her these little bits of things, they give her an instruction and they give her space and they go... Go go do it, mm-hmm. you, you, and she does. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what Miyazaki was trying to create when he wrote this movie was exactly showing people that and like showing it in such a fantastical, absurd place. Yeah, yeah. that like give these kids some space to realize that everything you've been teaching them that they've been listening to it and that they can do it. And you know, like I know I said that there were three examples that oh, I was yeah, talking sorry. about. It's all right. If anybody's watched Working Moms, there's a character in that whose name is Anne, who is a psychiatrist, and her daughter is getting into all sorts of trouble, and then she's been helicopter parenting, and then she ends up writing a book about hands-off parenting. Um, what does she call it? Uh, I think she does she call it hands-off parenting, where she like basically it like stops micromanaging all her daughter's stuff and goes like, "You're gonna figure it out." Mm-hmm. And that's a really you know, this is getting deep into it, but I think... Are we not, not getting deep into it or getting well, deep into it? No, I mean, yeah. Well, she probably... They probably <laughs> ripped that you. on that show off of Free Range Parenting, but... I mean, probably. Um, that show's great, And it's though. a hard to do... If you're not doing that for when a kid's younger, it is harder to do it when they're older because you aren't fucking up the status quo. And so it might be one of those things where you, in order to build up your kid's resilience, you're going to have to just kind of say like, I know in the past I did this for you. And I know that I'm asking you to do something new. So when you can validate the distress that comes from this change. Yeah. And say, and this is what we're going to do moving forward. And you might have to do it a few times, a few, 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 few times um, before your kid gets the picture. But the idea is, um, like you said, like building up. Because also, too... I guess a way to think of it as an adult, kind of what you were mentioning about the micromanaging part of it is if you're, if you're listening to me now and you're like, I don't know about this. Think about when you're at a job, when you're being micromanaged versus not micromanaged and how good it feels when you have a boss that gives you space to figure stuff out, to manage yourself. And cause you're like, you were saying, Ben, it inherently, it indirectly communicates that they trust you that they believe in you and that, and that it also lets you think outside the box more because I were also worked at jobs where I've been micromanaged and it does build up anxiety of, okay, am I doing that right? Well, I have to, I guess I have to check with somebody because I don't know if that's the way that we're supposed to be doing it. And you just start in here. You just start like doubting yourself in even the smallest ways Mm -hmm. because you are being observed. Yeah. And whenever we're being observed a lot and then dictated to, we can't help but have like a, a response to that. And so we do that with our children when we are all up in their business and they want independence. They want, like you're saying, Hannah, they want to be trusted. And being a free range parent does not mean that you're teaching your kid not to respect authority. Cause also in this movie, she still is asking people for their expertise. You know, when she talks to Zaniba, when she talks to Haiku, like when she even talking to like Kamaji and Lynn, like she's still trying to use resources and listen to people and has respect for people who know more than her, like quote unquote authority figures while still trusting her instincts and going with what feels right and true to her. So also when you do this more like hands off approach, you're allowing yourself and your children to tell the difference between a person with the expertise and authority that you should listen to versus just an adult or a, another an kid. Yeah. Or, an, or just or listen or kid. just like, yeah, being guided by someone else. Well, in something, in something that I know that I've said probably a hundred times, 
if you want your kid to learn about it from somebody else, that's what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. They Hello, will, sex ed. They will absolutely learn it from someone else. And do you really want that to be the way that they learn something that you feel like you're too anxious to fucking talk about? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, they, and they will every time. The kids they'll, will or talk. they'll find out on their own. And again, in a way that maybe won't be as helpful or as insightful or as understanding Safe. or appropriate. So, yep. Mm-hmm. anyway. And, yeah, and we, and we <laughs> see these. So since we're all going bananas here, I feel like I have to mention the third yeah. media mm-hmm. thing that I mentioned. Yes. Which the other person that we have talked about on this show who has done, we have seen this happen, is Alfred with Bruce Wayne. Okay. It's like you have to give context. Not everyone just knows what Alfred means. I know. I'm giving context. <laughs> Most people know that I like Batman a lot and that I'm a, a big uh-huh. fan of Batman. But we see Alfred do this with Bruce a lot. Even like as we watch in Batman Begins, in The Dark Knight, and in particularly the Michael Caine version of Alfred. We see this. The Michael Goff version, not so much um, that I remember. But the Michael Caine version of Alfred, we see a lot of this installing lessons and giving Bruce space to make his own mistakes and learn from them and go like, and like I know the dynamic is, you know, a little bit different there. Daddy but Butler. Mm-hmm. Daddy Butler, which is, you know, there's, there's some power issues there, mm-hmm. but we still, we see this same thing. I'm, I'm, I have not talked about Batman in four episodes and I'm aware of that. So I'm letting you talk. I know, but we didn't even say anything. I'm listening. At, I'm, at, I'm listening. You're also giving me the, the business. Well, I'm thinking about the fact that also Bruce Wayne is a rich white person who even when he makes horrible decisions like he does time after time in Batman Begins, he has the um, cushioning of being a rich white man. That Right, that someone's going to show up with your private jet to Mongolia and get you out of prison? Yeah. And so I don't usual, know if he's a good example. He's fine. <laughs> I don't know if I believe that he's a good example of free range stop parenting. dressing up in fucking costumes and use that money for something. Right. Ugh. Like, yeah, the... Uh, the thing, the best thing to do for my money would be to go to space. Oh, that's it. God, everyone in their space can. I mean, that's a whole other discussion. I know it is, but anyway, let's no, fix I, planet I, Earth first, we, y'all. We we see this, this some exa- several examples of of these free range things where people are given some space to make mistakes. We see it with Yoda could have stopped Luke from leaving Dagobah. He really could have. <laughs> You're really hitting all your greatest. Heads, I aren't really you? am. I'm trying really hard. It's. Yeah, I know. You can fucking tell. I know, but <laughs> anywho, I well, feel even, like even thinking back to some of our positive parent um, examples, like um, in Easy A, the parents that she has there, would they, you know, give, her, give her? Yeah, they give her space or well, call me by your name. Call me by your name, mm-hmm. where they also do those parents do the same thing, and so and showing the and how in the films we see the growth of the character. And then even though they might have to experience something that is painful, that that is a that that is a natural part of being a fucking human. Well, also I'd say Wrinkle in Time is another great one. Where oh, we talk yes. About yes. how she doubts herself um, until she goes a similar story. Like she goes on an adventure that requires her to start listening to herself versus trying to figure out what's wrong with her. Or what she what is she doing wrong all the time? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Which you know is definitely an episode from our season one. I think it was the that the third, the third one we did. It was yeah. the third one we did. Yeah. Yeah. That's so far the lowest volume episode, and despite uh-huh. that, that movie not being awesome <gasps> or doing awesome. I love Wrinkle and Time. I know you guys I it. love it, Ben. I know you guys. I know. I know you loved it. I. I know a lot of people. I, I, I shared a lot of the the criticisms of the, the common know. public, but. You know, the episode is really great, and you guys should check it out if you haven't. Um, we did have fun talking about it. We though. did. And we that did. was it was early on, so there's, you know, probably some fun things to laugh at us and see what we're still doing. Oh, then. my gosh. <laughs> but I feel like now would probably be a pretty good time to take a quick break and then transition to treatment, unless you guys have anything else yeah. you want to talk about on this topic here. Yeah, no, no, no. I think we're good. I don't oh. even... Yeah, go ahead. All right, so we'll take a quick break here. Let's move into treatment. So when we look at these these characters, who would we want to... Does it even make sense for us to do treatment, I feel like? I mean, she's pretty self-actualized. Here, I guess in, in lieu of treatment... And I've also... Kind of, in lieu of treatment... Because I talked about free range parenting. And, and I would say if I was going to work with a family where they're trying to adopt more of this because they're noticing, like, 
our kid isn't very independent. Our kid is lacking some maybe what we call like ADLs, activities of daily living. Like they can't problem solve or they're like, I would say when you do that in a family therapy capacity, which I do, um, you always have to be mindful if you're like a clinician listening that you have to, I think it's always very helpful to acknowledge, you have to, in my opinion, acknowledge the anxiety that's going to come from the parents about this, what you're going to recommend to them. So I always try to really dig into some compassion and connectiveness with the parents without the kids in the session to really acknowledge, like, this is what I'm recommending. I know it feels wild to do. I know it's going to feel really anxious. And a lot of times what you have to do is, it can feel a little anxiety provoking on my part because I'm really asking these parents to trust me and I'm hoping nothing happens, (laughs) like nothing really bad happens. Um, And um, really, and sometimes you have to just walk beside the parents. And like I said, say things like, reframe this, like, this is an opportunity where your kid might experience some anxiety and some frustration. That's okay. I, re- I really try to reframe a lot of these experiences as just discomfort. Like the worst thing that's going to happen is your kid's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. And they can get through that. I think because of anxiety as a parent, it can be, it seems like it's very easy to exaggerate the feeling out for yourself. And be like, this is the worst thing that can happen to my kid. They're never going to get over this. They're going to, I mean, they're like, they're not gonna, like you catastrophize basically is what I'm getting at. And so what I really try to do is, is reframe it and make it appropriately small of like, what's the worst thing that's gonna happen is your kid's gonna have some discomfort. Your kid's gonna learn how to deal with frustration. They're gonna sit in that frustration. They're gonna sit in that discomfort. And then they're gonna build up resiliency around those feelings. And that's okay. You know, it's really more coaching the parents on how to sit with their own discomfort and anxiety around watching their child suffer. I mean, I don't think it's that deep, but it feels that deep for parents. Absolutely. And so I think in doing this work with parents and helping their kids be empowered, it's way more of working with the parents versus working with the kid, in my opinion, in my experience. Yeah. And also, I mean, I think something I also want to acknowledge with that anxiety is in learning more about free range parenting, and I, there's still a ton I have to learn, um, is that in listening to like Lenora talk about it, is that the rise of also this more helicoptering parenting coincided with uh, with the rise of the 24 hour news cycle, and how before that, before we had like national news, we only had local news. So if a kid got hurt, went missing, got kidnapped, whatever, something worse you only really knew if it happened in your town. And so with the kind of birth of national news, with things like, um, oof, Adam, the kid that went missing, whose dad became the unsolved, not unsolved mysteries, but like America's most wanted. Who am I thinking? Uh, I don't remember. I know who this is and I would know their name. Any other time. I was thinking about this too, like this whole generation of stuff that we watched, like, all of us and like uh, the Gen Xers above us would have watched like the John Bonet Ramsey and all these things like play out on this all these news cycles. So I know kind of what you're talking. About. I was thinking the same thing. Like, Adam Walsh, John Walsh. Ah. So yeah, so Adam Walsh went missing, and I believe he was found. Um, I, ho- I apologize to all the murderinos out there if I'm getting that wrong. And kind of that happened in. Did you just say murderinos? That's what, yeah. like, my favorite murder people, like, people yeah. who follow true crime. And so, and that happened in the early 80s. And I so, learned something today. between that and national news, it kind of, it started to create this idea, this fear within parents that kids are going missing all the time. Yeah. And your kid can get kidnapped walking out the door. And that if they, on the way to school, and does that happen? Of course it does. And statistically, it's so minuscule. This is what Lenora says when she talks about it, when she tries to address this fear, is that it is, it, it's such a min, it, could it happen? Yeah. And the possibility of happening to your child is astronomically small. But because of the way we take in news and true crime, we have made it seem like it happens every, like it could, it, there's like your kid has a 70% or not a hundred percent chance of being kidnapped, hurt, whatever. If you if don't they watch do things them. by themselves. Yeah. yeah. 
And so I definitely encourage people to learn more about free range parenting. If listening to this is exciting to them or feels really interesting, or if they're interested in that as a clinician to advise to families, it's, a, it's definitely something I'm still in the early stages of learning about. Uh, I know she has a book. I need to read it. Um, that kind of addresses it more. I'm really bad about reading books for uh, my work. Basically. I like to read fiction. And so girl, you do you exactly. self care and treat and, yourself. <laughs> thank you. And so, but I think, it is interesting to think about where do these fears come from and being mindful of that. So that's kind of what I just had about treatment, giving some extra perspective on um, free range parenting and kind of how you can introduce that. Cause even with families I work with who aren't doing that specifically, that is a concept that comes up is like saving an accommodation. Um, and the way that it's talked about in therapeutic work is just, are you um, enabling your child's anxiety, your child's distress? And therefore never letting them get used to that feeling. And so it's always going to feel hard. You're always going back to zero in terms of their Mm -hmm. resilience with distress. Mm -hmm. So just something to be mindful of and to perhaps use and practice. Well, and I think in terms of um, treatment, I'll just kind of um, chat a little bit about how I talk about it. And it's pretty similar to the way that you talk about it, Brittany. I think I talk about it in terms of modeling. Mm hmm. And talking a lot to parents about what do you do when you get upset? What do you do when you're sad? Your kid is a little sponge and they're going to soak it up. So if we want like, A, the changes you're going to have to make with with your child are going to be hard, but they're also going to be anxiety provoking for you. So what can you do or what kind of plan can we make in terms of self-care, in terms of how will you get support to manage through the discomfort that you're going to have to deal with of having maybe a kid who has two tantrums a day instead of, instead of, you know, one for a little while until they get used to the change that's happening and, or get used to them having to make a decision about something or learn something that is in a very safe, protected (coughs) space. Um, and being able to, and, and again, just back to the idea of giving, giving the kid a chance, but also having some more insight for yourself that the way that you manage your emotions is that's the first thing kids learn (laughs) is how are the people around me responding to what's happening? And do I need to do anything to take care of them? Or do I just have to take care of me or whatever? Like there's a thousand different messages that can be sent. But one of the most important things is that if you model this behavior, that can also help the idea of when we talk about um, working with families or working with parents or even with couples, they have to have buy-in. And one of the ways to help people have buy-in is helping um, the kid also know that we're both learning together we're doing this together. We're going to make this change so that home feels um, more comfortable for both of us. And that this isn't just the kid has a problem, fix the kid. Because that is just not ever true. It's just not ever true. It's about the family system. It's about the way that thoughts and behaviors and emotions are managed in the family system, period. So For parents out there who really feel like it's just this one thing that my kid does, take a step back and maybe and talk to somebody and work or even ask. I've been trying to be more aware in my work with families um, or with young kids or like tweens is trying to keep the parents in the loop as much as I can and help them so that they can be a support so that they also don't have this feeling of my kid is going to get better or change because they're talking to Hannah one time a week. Like they, we need to be able to create an environment with which they can make those changes uh, for themselves. Again, to go back to this empowerment piece of how fucking important it is to help a child feel like they can make good decisions and that they have, they know how to do things and that they don't need us holding their hand through every single part of life because they're not going to have that at some point. Mm-hmm. And how much healthier of a relationship you can also have as a parent when you aren't in your kid's shit all the fucking time and how much less stress you will feel in the long run of knowing that you have a kid who knows how to problem solve. It's also probably makes you more inherently resentful towards your child if every problem is your problem then. Of course yeah. it does. <laughs> Absolutely. Of so that's all so being like, okay, figure that out. Yeah, so that's all I wanted to just add just like kind of what I talk about. Sure. No, oh, I like that. 
I am going to go in a bit of a different direction because I feel like you two covered the child aspect. And I know a lot of people that listen to our show are clinicians. Mm -hmm. And something that I think that is important to take from this movie, from a clinical standpoint, I think I have... I think I've got 12 LCPCs that I've signed off for now. Wow. As a supervisor? As a supervisor. Like 12 people that I've supervised that have made it to full licensure now, I think. And I think some of these things that we're talking about with... Well, and you're a great supervisor. Oh, I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is that learning how to supervise people properly follows many of these same tenets. And that, like Brittany's saying, like you will start to resent your staff if their problems <laughs> become your problems. Yes. Mm-hmm. And Independence is a gift you give others and also yourself. Mm-hmm. Correct. <laughs> and the, the thing that becomes like important about this is that it, as for many people, they... When you start off in this career, you're given supervisory reins probably before you should have been given supervisory reins because a lot of us get put into positions where as soon as you get your license, boom, you're, you're, you've got interns or you've got uh, provisionally licensed staff. Especially when you're doing work in mental health agencies. Correct. Um, you know, Who like, also have supervisors who've never been trained to be supervisors in terms of a business. Go ahead, Ben. Right, because... I, I don't I need to look into like how psychologists are trained but I don't know if they have the same requirement we have mm. but also it's not true in every state in Ohio where I'm from in order to supervise you have to be trained shadow someone who supervises and get an extra amendment to your license like a little s on the end mm. to supervise so there are some places yeah yeah where, it's different like I wouldn't be able to supervise in Ohio if I went back but I supervise here in Illinois because if you just have the independent license, you can go full hog. <laughs> right. Even though you're not really supposed to till you take the 18 hour supervision thing. But that's not due until your first full actual renewal, which is four years mm-hmm. into mm-hmm. having it, basically, yeah. which is bananas. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Um, but the like the thing that you have to learn as a supervisor is that much like as your child, your children grow, is that there's a phrase uh, that... I read somewhere from, I believe it's a Hebrew proverb, but is something along the lines of don't try to provide guidance to your children from the world you lived in. They are not of this time. Mm. Or, or they're, they're not of, they're of a different time. Yeah. The, the, the advice that you try to give to people about your world doesn't necessarily apply to them. And you have to realize that when you're supervising people and developing therapists is... Well, you may not be of a different time than them. You were definitely trained on different things than them, and the curriculums may have changed, and the wave of the current influencing factor in mental health, because that goes through waves. When I went through school, and probably when you two were going, it was all about diversity. Diversity, 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 everything. Mm -hmm. And now it's been about mindfulness and social justice. Mm-hmm. have been the things that have started to to sweep into the popular f- focus of things. Yeah, absolutely. And the the focus on diversity is still there, but it's not like the buzz thing that everybody's working into their curriculum and trying to force. And having to remember that people are going to come into situations with their clients, they're going to have to describe it to clients using their language using their training and using the way they understand the problem and trying to force them to see it the way you do and be under the assumption that just because you as the supervisor see a problem one way means that's the only possible interpretation is a fallacy. Mm -hmm. And you are stripping your supervisees of the opportunity to explore a problem from their own standpoint and develop competency and confidence in their therapeutic modalities of choice and being able to blend the balance between let me provide you from perspective versus you need to see it the way I am mm-hmm. is a total difference that changes the way whether you develop competent staff who believe that they can be therapists and can go on and do things or if you develop people that are dependent and dogmatic on the way things were researched with 
largely white college students in 1978. You're going to take your ego out of it, too. Like your ego that you do it the right way. And that if they do it differently or they challenge that, that it's like inherently wrong. That it's wrong. And realizing that you have to help your clients, just like Chihiro, is give them the information and the guidance that they need to develop into the clinician that they're going to be. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I cannot stand when supervisors are like, you have to do it this way. You have to do it that way. You have to do it this way. Because that's the wrong way to work with me. I did, that's just going to rub me the wrong way. I, for those of you that are developing clinicians or becoming supervisors for the first time, I want you to like take from this that you have the opportunity to teach people what you have learned while also learning from your students the things that you might not know and taking that and empowering them to teach you their understanding of their client so that you can then teach them your understanding of their client and your understanding of them to let them find the best path forward without mandating they do anything that doesn't need to be mandated. Some things need to be mandated, but you can grow a person and grow their confidence so they can become who they're going to be. It's never going to be a clone of you, and that's okay. But the best thing, the best gift that you can give someone you supervise is the confidence that they have everything that they need in themselves through their education and their worldview to be who they're going to be. And that's enough mm -hmm. for their clients because the right clients will find them. Yes. The clients that you're the right fit for might not be the client that's a right fit for Brittany. The clients that are right fit for me aren't the same as the ones that are right fit for Brittany. They aren't mm -hmm. the same ones that are the right fit for Hannah. Yeah. And that's true for all clinicians and it's, I think it's an important thing to remember that as you develop clinicians you must give them the opportunity to be in situations where they are uncomfortable and can make mistakes and be given space to learn from them without being shamed yes mm -hmm. absolutely because in the words of Jake the dog you have to really suck at something before you get good at it <laughs> <laughs> exactly so if we want to transition to final thoughts um i can just go first um like i said at the top i've never seen um a studio ghibli um movie before i'm also not familiar with anime at all i'm trying because um when i grew up i didn't know anybody um who watched anime or knew anime like i didn't nothing yeah. and now i think it's becoming more mainstream and i definitely work with a lot of people now who are into it so i'm trying to get more understanding of it and immerse myself a little bit more in it just to kind of a tool like a when you work with um especially if you work with teenagers and kids you have to be making a concerted effort in my opinion to be in the know of what they're into like so Absolutely. i've been trying to learn more about anime because definitely. the kids i work with like it a lot so I'm really so I had no idea what I was getting to this movie. It really took me off guard. It like zigged when I thought it was gonna zag. Like I couldn't have told you predicted one element of this movie. <laughs> I couldn't have told you what the next five minutes were gonna be at any given time in this movie, which did crack me up and confuse me to be quite honest. But I am intrigued to watch more. Um, I know like my neighbor Totoro is like a really beloved one. Apologies, I said that wrong. Um, and so I know that's a beloved one. So I definitely am curious to like um, um watch more mm -hmm. of these movies. Is it like 100% like my jam? No, but it, that's okay. Not everything has to be my jam. Um, just like I said, I'm not super le I'm not super drawn to um, animated movies kind of in general. Um, and specifically like anime, I've just never had a lot of exposure to. So I'm definitely curious to learn more. I'm always interested if people have any suggestions to me via if you want to dm us on instagram or something uh, about like animes or or studio ghibli movies or anything like that that's been really or similar that's meaningful meaningful to them i'm interested in any suggestions um but yeah i mean i think it was fun it was cute i'm like in talking about it i feel a lot more a little more in love with it in terms of the messaging yeah. of it um but yeah those are my final thoughts um I'll go next. So 
I agree with a lot of what kind of Brittany said. Like I have heard a lot more about anime, I would say in the last two years actually, than I had ever heard about it before. And so it's been, um, I've been, I have watched a couple of things here and there. Um, and I did, I was very confused by this film initially, but it, it, and after talking about it, and even after having um, Brittany read the Wikipedia um, synopsis at the end, kind of helped me um, kind of be able to create the ideas that were around it that helped me understand it better. So I thought it was a really um, beautiful movie. I really, I think one of my favorite effects in terms of the animation was when her hair would react to the way that she was feeling. And I thought that that was such an amazing um, visual way to show something, especially because I don't feel like we use hair. <laughs> the monster came in and her hair was like, what? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like just the way that it showed so accurately, I felt like the way that we can feel or like even feeling like your hair is standing on end, even if it, it, is, it isn't. So I really loved that. I'm definitely interested in watching more. And as, as always, please send us... Um, recommendations of, of things that you guys really like. Um, and I would just say I'm interested to watch more movies um, and to get a better sense of uh, of this whole genre, just kind of in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can go. So I, I first got exposed to um, Studio Ghibli films uh, when I was... Working, or I was in Operation Snowball, which was a uh, thing I did in high school. It was kind of like teen prevention theater plus a uh, encounter group. It was a really cool program, but we as a staff kind of had a, a sleepover, and we watched Princess Mononoke. Don't... <laughs> don't do that don't no no looks no looks anyway it sounds the, cute sounds cute you guys are the worst. Yes. like a church lock-in i love it yeah but no oh no, no I, not jesus yeah yeah no jesus yeah, know. <laughs> it had a spirituality like there was a spirituality yeah. like day thing but yeah, this was not anyway you guys are the worst um <laughs> the um i get exposed to princess mononoke which is kind of like fern gully but without the silliness uh and it was fantastic and i remember going like this movie is awesome and staying up way too late watching it and thinking it was a lot longer than I thought it was going to be but I hadn't watched another one since and when so many people are like you have to watch Spirited Away I have to do Spirited Away you guys have to do it I'm like okay I'm excited to do it I just I'm not a big anime fan and like I feel like after watching this one I need to watch more of at least these and if not expose myself to some others that I can get a chance to digest and see the amazing art even though it's not like my favorite style, that it's incredible. I remember like thinking there was one scene where they were in the steam room, like, and just thinking about like the art that went into just the pipes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And how much work that had to be to get all those details in. I was like just so impressed by that. And then the storytelling, and then learning that Miyazaki doesn't even write a script until they're in production. Mm. I know. I know. Now I kind of want to watch the movie and just watch the pictures. And like kind of ignore the dialogue almost. And just because I feel like that would make more sense to me than, than and especially with all the background we've talked about too. Yeah. And I, I would like to, to watch more of these, but I love this film and I look forward to sharing it with my daughter. This, this was an Oscar winner. This one mm-hmm. best mm-hmm. animated picture. And it's the only one to have done it. Mm-hmm. The only animated uh, film from another country that oh, won an yeah. Oscar. Mm-hmm. For the best animated, yeah. For best animated picture, which is amazing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And to think that this film, for 19 years, was the top-selling film, Mm -hmm. the top-grossing film in Japan. Yeah, that's crazy. It is bananas. But I see why. Yeah. It's such an incredible, amazing film, and I'm really happy that we got to do it, and it was something so different from everything else we've watched we haven't done like a straight fairy tale that's no from another culture that like forced us into a place where we know nothing about what's going on so i really like that i like to learn i like to expand my mind and i really appreciated like, mm-hmm. seeing this film and getting to experience it for the first time ever mm-hmm. and i i loved it and i will definitely be watching it again and i will show it Same. to my daughter when she's old enough yeah i'm definitely gonna watch it again 
Well, final, final thought is thanks for recommending this to us, guys, and helping us expand our um, movie palettes. Um, if you want to recommend any more to us, you can message us at popcornpsychology at gmail.com. You also can find us at Instagram and Facebook at Popcorn Psychology and Twitter at popcorn underscore psych. We're also right now, depending on when you're hearing this, but if you're hearing this um, right now, right now, right now, <laughs> um, we are also um, up for a podcast award. Um, we're looking for nominations for that. So if you go on our Instagram, you can find a link for that in our bio. Um, and as always, like Ben said at the top, if you could um, leave us reviews, rating, subscribe, um, wherever you enjoy podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. That helps us more than you know. We also have a Patreon if you'd like to support us that way. And we also actively have merch on Tee Public if you want to find us through that, if you want to support us through that um, way as well. But thanks again for listening and we will hear from you next time. <laughs>